economic growth historically has been based on both kind of injustices. It's been colonial, it's been based on the plunder and theft of resources and human bodies, but it also perpetuates injustices globally. So there is no degrowth without addressing injustices. Hello, and welcome to the Ecopolitics Podcast, Season 2, Global Ecopolitics. This is a podcast for university students tackling some of the big questions in the field of global environmental politics. I'm Ryan Katz-Rosine from the University of Ottawa, co-host of the show along with uh, Peter Andre from Carleton University, although he won't be joining us for this episode. And I am very excited for today's episode. Uh, Today, we'll be speaking about the growth environment relationship, or perhaps better uh, known as the growth environment debate. Uh, You would think that this is a settled affair. You'd think there would be scientific consensus on the relationship between, say, the size of a nation's economy and environmental well-being. And yet, the exact nature of this relationship is the subject of very heated debate, particularly within academia. We're wondering today, how has this come to be? What are the various sides of this debate? What role does economic growth play in the global environment? And can it be mobilized to support genuine sustainability? Or do we need to find ways of living without economic growth? To help guide us through this theme, we have two experts in the field. Susan Paulson, professor of Latin American studies at the University of Florida, and Bengi Akbulut who is an assistant professor in geography, planning, and environment at Concordia University. Uh, My first question is going to be for you, Susan. Um, I mentioned at the outset that there is a growth environment debate. I'm wondering where you would place the origins of this debate. Great question. Let me start by distinguishing material growth from economic growth. So we think about material growth as increase in the quantity of matter and energy transformed by human societies. That's trees cut down, coal burned, plants eaten. Material growth is calculated by thermodynamic measures. Economic growth refers to monetary value of goods and services exchanged in a given market. We measure economic growth with something like gross domestic product, GDP. In today's world, there's a very broad consensus that ongoing material growth is damaging the environment and must be halted in order to sustain Earth systems to allow human societies to thrive and even survive. In contrast, economic growth continues to be widely embraced as beneficial, even necessary. And that's the trouble, because to date, material and economic growth have been intimately married, deeply inseparable. And so we think one is great and the other is bad. How do we separate them? That's the growth environment debate. There's actually two problems involved. First is that, as we mentioned, growing economies use more resources and cause more environmental degradation. But there's another problem is that mechanisms of growth require exploitation and unequal exchange, which creates inequality. Much of the 20th century has been about addressing challenges of inequality and poverty through experiments with what we call inclusive growth, figuring out how to grow and and not exclude and hurt some people, right? And so there's been some notable successes in communist, socialist, and capitalist societies. However, most reverted back to growing inequality starting in the 1980s. With this inclusive growth in limbo, 21st century is becoming a scramble towards green growth, which is a kind of hypothetical future system in which we imagine that GDPs will still grow while use of material and energy will decrease. Anyway, people are fantasizing about that option. So I'm hearing a couple possible points of origin, but I think ultimately you're linking this to some of the debates about how to make growth more inclusive, which occurred in the 20th century. Bengi, where would you place the origins of this debate? Well, it's hard to follow Susan (laughs) on her very, very, I think, um, kind of concise and comprehensive explanation. I think the origins are in kind of growth also equated to development and growth also being equated to a sustained increase in human well-being. 
And it's always been a contested idea. As Susan has said, the growth that we've seen and we have been seeing also recently is capitalist growth. That is, that has a very particular historical uh, trajectory. And it's been based on unequal exchange and it's been based on exploitation of both humans and non-humans. It's been based on colonialism. So I think there's that kind of contestation to the idea of growth and, and its equation to human betterment. That's always been a part of the history of capitalist growth. Um, but we see this idea of whether growth could be sustainable, especially ecologically, kind of coming up in different guises um, throughout the history of capitalism, but also throughout the history of economics, for instance, as a social science. So, for instance, the idea of environmental Kuznets curve, which has been used to justify kind of um, and to, to claim uh, that growth can be sustainable. And even if we don't see that kind of economic growth is sustainability right now, that just kind of keep growing and it's going to become environmentally sustainable at some point. So new technologies also have resource requirements. They also have biophysical implications on all of us. And what is kind of what makes it even worse is that these resource requirements or biophysical implications have always been unequally distributed. So the unsustainability of growth, even if it's through new technologies or uh, renewable energy, it will it is likely to fall onto uh, the global south, it is likely to fall onto the marginalized sections of our societies um, who have already kind of uh, shouldered the burden of growth so far. So what is sustainable or if whether or not growth is seen to be sustainable is very much tied to which costs, which ecological and social costs of growth are we making visible or can be made visible. And that's ultimately a question of politics. That's ultimately a question of power relations. Which costs of growth have we seen so far, have been made visible, have been kind of struggled against so far? And, and what do we kind of define as, uh, as costs of growth that we find sustainable or unsustainable? And it can make us clean up our mess better. So that with technological innovation, we will find ways to produce things better, to produce things more cleanly. And we will find also ways to kind of clean up our pollution or reproduce and regenerate ecosystems, for instance. That's kind of that's sometimes known as the idea of decoupling. So this idea that growing GDP, growing economic output can be delinked uh, or can continue without an equal rate of increase in the material and energy that that economy uses. So basically, we can grow without using so much of materials and energy. So the role of technology basically is what the contemporary kind of disagreement on the sustainability of growth centers on. And I mean, we have kind of the techno-optimists or, or green growthers who say, hey, we can do this better in the future. And on top of that, um, we need growth. We need a growing GDP in order to fuel technological innovation. So that's another key assumption that we cannot actually kind of find better ways of doing it without growing. On the other side, we have the critics of, of green growth or, or, for instance, degrowth, who criticizes this assumption, this techno-optimism, sometimes called techno-optimism, sometimes called eco-modernization, um, saying that, hey, wait, I mean, there are many reasons to be skeptical of being so optimistic of what technology can do for us. Um, there are different reasons to be skeptical. One of them being, uh, one of them known, known as the Jevons paradox or sometimes known as the rebound effects, uh, which basically says that we can become, we can find or discover more eco-efficient ways of producing things but the adoption of that technology or technique uh, at a larger scale will basically uh, lead to a higher level of resource and energy consumption uh, overall. So this is kind of this is often traced back to Jevons, who was looking at uh, coal-fired engines in England, and basically what Jevons observed was that 
uh, as engines were becoming more efficient, so as they were using less coal, so as less coal per engine was being used, the, the technology, that efficient technology was also becoming a lot more widespread. So overall, the use of coal, although per engine use of coal was decreasing, the aggregate use of coal was increasing. So we see that happening in different ways with new technologies all around us as well. So new technologies also have resource requirements. They also have biophysical implications on all of us. And what is kind of what makes it even worse is that these resource requirements or biophysical implications have always been unequally distributed. So the unsustainability of growth, even if it's through new technologies or uh, renewable energy, it will it is likely to fall onto uh, the global south. It is likely to fall onto the marginalized sections of our societies um, who have already kind of uh, shouldered the burden of growth so far. So what is sustainable or if whether or not growth is seen to be sustainable is very much tied to which costs, which ecological and social costs of growth are we making visible or can be made visible. And that's ultimately a question of politics. That's ultimately a question of power relations. Which costs of growth have we seen so far, have been made visible have been kind of struggled against so far? And, and what do we kind of define as uh, as costs of growth that we find sustainable or unsustainable? Thank you, Bengdi. And, and you raise a number of concepts um, which you've done a great job of defining, you know, the environmental Kuznets curve, uh, the Jevons paradox, uh, eco-modernism, which you sort of equated with techno-optimism as well. Um, and you, you conveyed, you know, you answered my, my subsequent questions about uh, what I, w- I was hoping to ask about, you know, what exactly is decoupling, you know, this, this idea that's central to these, this idea of, of an environmental Kuznets curve. So I'm going to ask, though, because, you know, I, I'm thinking of a talk I attended a couple of weeks ago with a, a, the ambassador of an unnamed uh, Scandinavian country. But the claim was, we have achieved essentially a, a, a measure of significant decoupling from not just our sort of domestic emissions at a national scale from economic growth, but we've actually decoupled our impact from the entire consumption-based footprint of the country. In other words, the claim was we have achieved, you know, a uh, absolute decoupling, at least in a, in a you know, territorial scale, a national scale. And that reminded me that, you know, we have all kinds of evidence for what we can call decoupling. Again, this de- decoupling of the impact from economic growth and its environmental impact. I take your point, Bengi, that you've given some ideas about why there continues to be skepticism about this concept of decoupling. But I'm wondering if Susan wants to add in there on why the evidence for it, which is presented, is not considered sufficient for many people who are critical of green growth. I would love to come in, Ryan, on this question. Um, You described this um, discussion of decoupling by a Scandinavian country. Certainly some countries, notably a few Scandinavian countries, have managed to de-link the pace of growth of their GDP from specific indicators. For example, growth of water use, growth of of climate change emissions, et cetera, right? And so what we see are are, are unique separations there. Um, Some, many countries have also managed to reduce the total global footprint per extra dollar of GDP. Now, as Benke was explaining, as long as things become more efficient in a capitalist competitive system, that can actually help growth. And so economies will continue growing. So even if each extra dollar GDP costs less water or less emissions or less eco footprint overall, as long as you grow, you're going to have some greater contribution. And imagine if you go Nowadays, people are going 3% a year, that adds up and it becomes cumulative. So that's a problem. I just want to point out, 
you say there's evidence. Um, there's a very strong uh, publication called Decoupling Debunked, Evidence and Arguments Against Green Growth as a Sole Strategy for Sustainability. That was published uh, in 2019 by Climate and Energy of the European Union, right? And it basically argues that um, evidence is overwhelmingly clear that there's no empirical evidence supporting the existence of decoupling of economic growth from environmental pressures on anywhere near the scale needed to deal with environmental breakdown. And such decoupling appears unlikely or impossible in the future. So basically they said, yes, attempts to decouple are great, but they also need to be accompanied by attempts to reduce the GDP and the consumption altogether. So we need both, basically, is the argument, right? So what you're talking about is evidence of unique, oh, look, I made one car with less material than we used to. But if we're making twice as many cars as we used to, the Javon's paradox thing, it doesn't help us, right? And so you've got to separate the specific examples of increased efficiency that lead to unique decoupling of a phenomena to an overall historical impact through the years of whether each country is contributing to more resource use and more emissions and waste or to less. And I don't think we have any countries less that are in absolute terms reducing their total use of resources and their emissions. That we just haven't seen it. The empirical evidence says no country has done that yet. Thanks, Susan. That's a really uh, comprehensive answer. And I'm going to turn to to Bengi in a minute uh, for her take. But before I do, apologies, Bengi. Um, I want to ask you, Susan, about degrowth because Bengi did uh, bring up the term, and you have written a, a book called The Case. For degrowth, or I should say, you co-wrote a, a book called *The Case for Degrowth*. So I'm wondering if you can just take us back a little bit, a few steps, to just define what the degrowth movement is about. Right. Bengi described that there's been debate about ecological degradation and inequality since the emergence of colonial capitalism, since the emergence of fossil-fueled industrialization, all kinds of debate and conflict. Right. Together with critique of quite ambiguous impacts of technological innovations. So that's something that's been going on um, throughout the, the rise of industrial capitalism. In the late 20th century, heightened awareness of this, especially acute awareness of what was happening in the so-called third world, colonized places, prompted the emergence in the North of degrowth movements that said, hey, let's work to make healthy futures in three ways. One, by decreasing the quantity of material and energy used by wealthy economies. Two, by curbing our cultural and personal obsessions with growth. And three, by reorienting values, institutions, and worldviews around care and regeneration of humans and other nature. Sounds good, huh? You should, you'd be surprised people are so against it. It's a scary idea. So, you know, why are we starting to think this way? Obviously, climate change has shifted thinking, right? Revealing that high GDP countries are impacting world ecologies, but also post-colonial and decolonial voices and visions have revealed the asymmetrical power relations and relations of knowledge and science that have led to this uneven situation, right? And really push people from the North that say, no, 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 it's not about helping the poor suffering South. It's about cleaning up your own act, right? So in our new book, The Case for Degrowth, we ask how can OECT countries and societies clean up their own act in the sense of Establishing environments to support more equitable and sustainable paths to well-being for our own people that don't use everyone else's resource and produce a lot of waste that hurts other people. Right? So here's just a package of, of different sort of policies that we explore. Some are Green New Deals without growth, reduce working hours, guaranteed jobs, universal basic incomes and services, support of community economies and commons and commoning and reorganization of public finance. Basically, shifting all of these policies away from how can we grow the GDP to how can we enhance well-being, right? And so 
that's not so hard. Um, and we've been thrilled during COVID to see that governments across the political spectrum are starting to consider and implement some aspects of these proposals. The point is, even the best policies can't sustain that the kind of transformation we dream of without really deep social culture changes, changes that we're struggling with in our own hearts and our own lives and relationships, which is a quite sort of multi-dimensional journey. So we write about some of these, right? How can I in my life change everyday practices, relationships, design, myth and values that reproduce and accept institutions and social systems in which I'm part of, social and political movements? And I think the final message I really want to give is that for people working in degrowth, no one site or motor of change is privileged. It's not like, oh my God, we've got to have a revolution and take over the government, or we've got to change gender roles. Each one of us can make positive moves on really different fronts. And we just have this kind of faith in co-evolution, that those moves, those, those innovations will interact in unpredictable, often mysterious ways to lead us towards healthier futures. So that's, in a nutshell, some ways that I'm thinking about degrowth. Well, that's a very detailed nutshell. So thank you, Susan. And I know Bengi wants to add in here, and I should note that uh, Bengi has also written a a piece on degrowth, which just came out in a a journal called Rethinking Marxism. Bengi, when you hear Susan define degrowth, what comes to your mind? How would you add to the discussion? When Susan defines anything, I love it. So it's, <laughs> it's uh, it goes without saying. But um, so I think Susan really um, kind of made it clear that degrowth is not about less, or it is about less, but it is more fundamentally about different. So it's about building, demanding, kind of imagining and constituting and enacting a different kind of economy different kind of relationships, an economy that serves different purposes um, and organized differently. What I would like to add maybe is uh, that degrowth also is, is kind of um, is a strike against the power of the idea of growth. Uh, so it aims to dethrone the idea of growth. It's, it's automatic kind of equation with better. In that sense, it's, um, it's a politics about reclaiming our identities, our beings, our subjectivities uh, that is outside of this kind of almost automatic uh, imperative that we should be growing. So it's kind of, it's also a call for recovering and rediscovering ourselves as, as people who are not only consumers or producers or economic subjects, but also citizens and political subjects that can imagine and can mobilize towards things. So that's, uh, I think, uh, that's a strong point that's, um, that needs to, uh, that also kind of connects degrowth with other um, critiques of development, for instance, that is emerging uh, from, and that has always been in, uh, around, but especially is very strongly emerging from, from the global south. And, from indigenous, for instance, cosmologies of other ideas of living well that is not necessarily um, equated to having more material wealth or having economic growth. The second one, the second kind of um, maybe theme that I want to um, highlight about degrowth is the idea of justice. I mean, apart from the the very, um, I think, misleading um, equation of degrowth with uh, austerity, or, or drudgery, another equally misleading equation or representation of degrowth is that everyone has to do the same thing or it's going to be unjust or undemocratic. Uh, justice, the idea of justice, not only kind of justice in the sense of historical injustices that has been associated with, with the trajectory of, of capitalist growth, but justice today as well uh, is, is very fundamental to degrowth, in my opinion, or my idea of degrowth. So, um, for instance, Ryan, when we were talking about decoupling and this unnamed Scandinavian country whose growth has been decoupling from certain environmental impacts, most decoupling studies or measures are focused on uh, production. So it kind of 
shy skirts away from consumption activities. So um, most, again, decoupling or most demonstrations of decoupling kind of excludes what is kind of both what is imported into that country, whatever country we're talking about. And the imported goods might have a very detrimental environmental impacts when they were produced in a different country. So, for instance, if the global north is buying most of its foodstuff from the global south, it's basically kind of importing the nature of global south embodied in those, in those foodstuff. But if you're doing a production-based decoupling study, you wouldn't see these impacts. So Degrot has this idea of kind of both kind of moving towards a more just system within regions, within countries, but also correcting, doing things to correct historical injustices that growth has brought in between global south and north. So there's both kind of this notion of justice implied in this idea, but also that as as Susan also alluded to, there are different trajectories that can happen in degrowth. It doesn't mean that everyone has to degrow in the same way. Well, that might actually, that last point, Bengi, might be a, a good uh, segue to the next series of questions that I wanted to ask both of you. Uh, because, you know, Susan, for instance, uh, raised the idea that much of what you were writing about in the, in the, the book, at least, uh, was about OECD societies cleaning up their own act, I think was the, the framing that you used. Um, so Susan, you, you are part of a Latin American studies department and, and you have expertise there. And we do often hear criticism about the degrowth movement, that it's a philosophy uh, from those and, f- and for those in the global north, which doesn't have this sort of purchase in developing countries. So I'm wondering if we can talk about the way that degrowth finds itself or operates within a, in, in a developing economy context. Um, can we sort of interpret a role for degrowth uh, in a sustainable development strategy in the global south? Yes. <laughs> Good question. Um, there's a lot of confusion on this front. Let me go back a little bit to the 1970s. The earliest articulations of de croissance among Gortz, Illich, Latouche, they were very clear about the issues of international justice that Bengi uh, mentioned. And their sort of decolonial concerns led to critical divergences from mainstream development thought, right? First of all, heightened awareness of their and our historical positions at the heart of colonizing growth led people like European and U.S. thinkers to insist that wealthy countries put their own houses in order before intervening to fix the rest of the world on whose backs we grew, as Bengi described. We're bringing in not only all of our food, but of our our wood, our petroleum, our minerals, everything. We're getting from their bodies and their landscapes, right? And um, yet we're going to go fix them or something like that. So those are the questions at the the very roots of degrowth. Today, in our book, we criticize these kind of trickle-down and charity discourses that make it seem as if growth of wealthy countries and economies helps the global south, right? We're giving them jobs, right? And instead, we argue high-income countries like my own, like U.S., would be better off to focus on repaying our ecological debts and reversing the unequal flows of capital, but also of resources and waste. Anyway, so for my collaborators and myself, we think about degrowth as aiming to reduce the global impacts of wealthy societies to allow others more autonomy to apply their own resources for their own visions, to pursue their own visions of well-being. As you mentioned, Ryan, many people don't hear that, right? They assume that our goal is to impose one model of degrowth on the whole world. Now, I can understand that assumption because we've all lived our entire lives in a world obsessed with imposing growth on everybody, right? From Bretton Woods to the World Trade Organization, it was about, you know, universalizing this model. And so people are like, well, they're just now going to universalize a different model, right? But every day we're practicing unthinking that, right? Um, Because that kind of assumption leads to preposterous claims that 
you know, we're going to force austerity and deprivation on the world's poorest communities because those rich ones of us have caused climate change. And uh, you're right. Ryan mentioned that he hears these sort of indignant people that say, well, people from the global south, they're going to vehemently resist degrowth. That's ridiculous. Anyway, let me tell you. So I've been researching and living in the Andes and Amazon for many decades. I spent 15 years living in communities, um, mostly in the Andes, researching environmental management, right? And that's what's actually motivated me to embrace degrowth. Latin Americans who I know desperately want U.S. and Canadian companies to stop expanding their extracted ventures, right? To stop moving with more mines and more petroleum and more agro industries into their bodies and territories, right? They're not welcoming that. In fact, they're using their their bodies and their lives to fight against it. And people also want us to stop fueling climate change. People that claim that people in the global South want more growth, I'm not sure they're even talking to them because I'm not hearing a lot of that. What we see documented, for example, in the Environmental Justice Atlas, there's now almost 4,000 cases of people living with very low incomes who organize to resist economic development, mining, drilling, logging, ranching, factories, plantations, highways. Um, also, many Latin American thinkers who've really pushed the world to address coloniality to think about how concepts of the world and ideas and values have created disequilibriums and power hierarchies between North and South. So in conclusion, I'm not saying that people in Latin America are loving the word degrowth, although we did participate in a wonderful conference recently in Mexico that was called Descrecimiento México, right? The, the degrowth organization of Mexico hosted a world conference. There are people that embrace the world, but the word, but there's many other people who embrace long-standing traditions of a more harmonious, balanced life that's not driven by massive growth. So the way I think about it for myself is that for me, degrowth is for people positioned as colonizers, labeled as developed like myself, to seek paths that I can follow toward broader, healthier global horizons and let other people, respect other people to name and shape their own paths. That's great, Susan. Uh, quite a, a fascinating uh, scan, a, a brief one, but a scan of, of the way that this movement and uh, growthism and degrowth are sort of conceptualized in Latin America. Um, I want to turn to, to Bengi be, because Bengi has geographical expertise in Turkey's political economy, and I know she's based here in Canada. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, I think you've written about some of the the political difficulties that the degrowth movement has faced in Turkey. And I would imagine you would see a similar type of thing happening here in Canada. Can you touch on that? Uh, I think uh, I have a quote here from one of your articles uh, writing about the degrowth movement in, in um, Turkey. And you, you say that imagining and desiring degrowth would call for a radical reconfiguration of state society relationships. And I think what you're getting at uh, is that this is for the time being is not necessarily a politically palatable uh, movement, but correct me if I'm wrong. You're not wrong. <laughs> uh, I was just thinking when Susan was talking that it's, it's such a different context than what is the case in Turkey. And I'm from Turkey. Uh, and a lot of my work um, and activism and engagement with social and political movements have been um, mostly in Turkey. So that um, observation that you just quoted comes also from an experience and a lived experience and embodied experience. But what my my observation or my uh, perspective on the success or the potential of the degrowth movement in Turkey is uh, comes from very much uh, looking at how the state in Turkey has historically um, kind of made itself visible and justified its existence. So uh, I don't want to get too theoretical, but in kind of looking at the state, I use the political thinker Antonia Gramsci's work. And very, very kind of simply, um, Antonia Gramsci says that states do not, modern nation states do not only kind of govern by force by coercion, uh, but they try to get 
legitimacy. They try to get consent. They, they try to get an active support from the society that they, they rule. And Gramsci also says that one way and one fundamental way of doing that is uh, that the states, kind of the nation state itself, represents itself as a neutral institution that represents uh, the collective interest, the, the kind of the general interest of the society. And, and Gramsci was a Marxist and, and he kind of doesn't believe that there's any kind of collective interest because the society is fragmented. It's always kind of unequal. It's never an homogeneous field. So there's no one interest that represents all of us. Um, but Gramsci says like the states kind of justify their existence and, and kind of get support for their rule by saying, hey, this society needs this, basically. So this is our general collective interest, and I'm going to fulfill that. And by kind of using that idea, I look at Turkey, historically and contemporarily, and that kind of general collective interest or the pretense of it has always been uh, economic growth, or more precisely, modernization through economic growth. So that's been an idea that the Turkish state has always kind of justified its existence over. And another kind of aspect of this is that it's not only kind of that a ruling class kind of promises or like imposes maybe an idea of economic growth. The idea of economic growth or modernization through economic growth historically has shaped the Turkish society as well. So when you look at political parties in the history of, of kind of institutional politics in Turkey, every political movement uh, has some idea of how to modernize through economic growth or how to bring about rapid economic growth. Um, so it might be through like state interventionism, it might be through more free market policies, it might be export oriented or import substituting, but everyone subscribes to some, to some idea that, I mean, no one questions the necessity of economic growth. So there are no kind of alternatives to growth, but kind of alternatives of growth, like how to do it better. And all of the kind of political conflicts are around how to ensure kind of economic growth, uh, which way is the best way to ensure economic growth in a way. So when you look at kind of the more social movements as well, like there's no real radical um, challenge to the necessity, to the idea, to the ideology of economic growth uh, because of the way that state society relationships have been kind of shaped historically. Um, so one kind of the implication of this, uh, the kind of most politically, I guess, relevant implication of, implication of this is that right now in Turkey and historically in Turkey, questioning the idea of growth has been questioning the state is, is kind of an unpatriotic endeavor. So if, if you want to question the idea of growth and the necessity of growth, I mean, you should be ready to challenge everything about the state as well. And in that context, it's not a coincidence, perhaps, to observe that the only kind of social political force that questions lately the necessity of growth and the ideology of growth has been the Kurdish uh, freedom movement, who's also kind of questioning the necessity of a nation state. So um, that is kind of where my my political pessimism for a degrowth movement in Turkey comes from. So unless um, what is what kind of constitutes the basis of state society relationships, which is very much tied to economic growth, there will be no way for a kind of a strong um degrowth alliance movement to emerge and to, to gain a foothold. Bengi, what you're speaking about there in terms of the you know domestic politics in Turkey gets me thinking about one area where my students often get hung up, which is around trying to frame the question of green growth and degrowth along a traditional left-right political spectrum. And I think Maybe you'll agree that this is probably an oversimplification because we've, you know, I know I've seen examples of, uh, you know, Marxists who have advocated uh, a, a type of socialist green growth, you know, um, and 
certainly we we have examples of uh, eco socialists um, and other left thinkers who uh, are in favor of the types of uh, decoupling and eco modernists or techno uh, you know techno optimist uh, perspectives. So I guess I'm wondering, you know, can you uh, Bengi touch on how a left leaning degrowth perspective treats uh, some of these questions? Uh, of politics and and moreover, you know, is there a right leaning variant of degrowth? Uh, maybe that's where neo Malthusianism comes in. But where do you see the the left right spectrum on this, or is it just not worth going there? <laughs> I think you're right in in pointing out that growth versus uh, critique of growth. I will say because for me, degrowth is necessarily left the way that I understand and and define it, and I think Susan's definition and understanding as well is precisely a left one because it's a it's also a critique of exploitation it's a critique of colonialism so it's a, a decolonial anti-capitalist feminist degrowth that we are advocating here and i think should be but if we understand degrowth a lot more simplistically in the sense of just self-limitation it is true uh, and you're very right that it can be construed as a form of of uh, neo Malthusianism, and that's very detrimental, I think. So, I think a kind of a discourse of, let's say, contraction, uh, I wouldn't want to call it degrowth, but a contraction, a, a limitation, is definitely possible from a right, uh, right wing standpoint. So, Susan, wh- where do you uh, come in here in terms of this question of uh, traditional left right spectrum? Yeah, I think left right is really complicated in terms of growth and degrowth because, as Bengi suggested, understanding of of generating solidarity to transform for a more equitable world is a movement that has usually taken place on the left. However, today left wing positions are very against degrowth. For example, labor unions in many fronts are really about getting more cash and more uh, more job security for their people, which is construed as pushing economic growth, right? Grow the pie to get our union a, a better deal. And liberal feminists are about an opportunity to empower women by getting them into the high production world where they can push the glass ceiling and produce and earn just as much as as the big earning men. And so we've got people that might be positions that are considered left political positions, which are quite vehemently advocating for economic growth to advance their left interests. So for me, it's really confusing. And I think we need to do a lot of listening on that front. So we are running we we are running a little bit sh- short on time. So I do want to make sure I get in a question about a growth because this episode is titled "Growth Degrowth A Growth," and you've already defined the first two terms. Um, a growth, I think, it is typically referring to the idea of, of growth agnosticism, and I'm wondering where you see that fitting in, Susan. I, you know, to a certain extent, I get the sense that some degrowth. Scholars or some who identify as as uh, you know advocates of degrowth are in fact agnostic on the question of growth, but perhaps you can share your thoughts on that. Right, that's great. So first of all, I would say I'm agnostic about economic growth, GDP growth. I'm really concerned about reducing the material and energy used by our societal metabolism every day. I think everyone, every scientist and most activists in the world agree we have to do that. Can we do that with or without, depending on how we manage money and invent money and, and do different monetary policies, that may or may not connect with how much money flows through the markets, right? That's not particularly my issue, right? I want to reduce the use of matter and energy, and I want to enhance equitable well-being for humans and other nature. If we can do that with or without more flow of cash, you know, so be it. That's not so much a question I have, Um, which actually leads me into just a concluding point that you had mentioned before in our conversation that you wanted to touch on Green New Deal. 
because I think that is actually the core of this Green New Deal debate, right? We're having, there's actually a lot of positive political action happening. Governments in Iceland, Scotland, New Zealand have publicly pledged that future policies will prioritize well-being rather than economic growth. We get the IPCC saying everyone needs to decrease their emission, their emissions so that we can manage our shared atmosphere, right? So these different things are leading up to an idea that's percolating around the world that we can sort of rethink the eco-social business together. And that's what the idea of Green New Deal is about. And one thing I'm seeing is that it connects with left and right. For example, in Europe, there's a quite right-wing pro-market thing called the European Green Deal, which is about investing to produce a whole bunch more windmills and electric cars and stuff like that. And then there's something called the Green New Deal for Europe, which, for example, one of the 10 pillars is called ending the dogma of endless growth, right? It's a much more um, transformative position. And in Latin America also, there's several. There's um, the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean has this big push, which is also, you know, invest in green technologies. But then there's Pacto Eco Social del Sud, which is really this kind of ethnic, gender, and nature equity movement to create more wholesome worlds, right? And so there's these really different movements percolating under this banner of Green New Deal. And I think what we're dealing with in the US is sort of a, a compromise that I'm willing to be open for, which again, it's between left and right, uh, between agnostics of producing more cash or more GDP flow, because that happens to be an element in our US Green New Deal. But the way it's drafted also promotes integral moves towards more sustainable and just socio-ecosystems, right? And so I can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. I don't want to just because it mentions that we're also going to try to generate more cash with this baby. right? And so that's one place where my agnosticism about GDP growth can fit in, even though I'm not at all agnostic. I am totally committed to reducing the matter and energy that's produced by global systems. right? So that's a little bit on the front of this really valuable conversations emerging under the banner of Green New Deals around the world. Susan, that's a really useful clarification regarding what types of growth some in the degrowth movement are actually agnostic about and which kinds they are more fundamentally concerned about. Um, and you brought in the Green New Deal without growth. And I was worried we wouldn't have time for that, but you fit it in. So I'm going to turn to Bengi for a final question along these lines. Are you optimistic for the possibilities of a Green New Deal without growth, uh, particularly in the context of our present situation getting out of this post-COVID recovery? I am, I guess. Uh, I'm always optimistic. I mean, I wouldn't be, I guess, uh, doing any kind of act. No one would be doing any kind of activism if there wasn't any kind of optimism, I guess. As, as everything else, it depends on the combination of social forces that will be uh, that could be mobilized for a Green New Deal without growth. And and Susan mentioned um, a few ways that we could kind of imagine it. I think, uh, especially with COVID-19, a lot of uh, debate kind of was pushed out into the open about essential work and essential workers and how essential place they, they hold in our societies. So that combined with like this renewed interest, for instance, in universal basic income, I think is is kind of changing or, or at least like airing some ideas that are becoming a lot more commonsensical right now that could be uh, used to push for a, for a Green New Deal without growth. And, and from that, I understand a Green New Deal that doesn't necessarily want to create more to share more, but basically, rather than creating more jobs, for instance, pushes for uh, sharing the existing jobs more equitably, uh, or creating more, G rather than creating more GDP, pushing for a way to kind of share what is already here more equitably. And so why I'm optimistic now is first, I think there's some ideas that are becoming a lot more commonsensical right now in the post-COVID situation that could be used about 
uh, to push for such a Green New Deal. And the second one, I think, is um, the, the kind of the decolonial and indigenous critiques of, of Green New Deal that are emerging, for instance, from Red Nation or from indigenous groups in, uh, for instance, in so-called Canada that are uh, very much also kind of putting it in, in out in the open how how colonial and unjust growth has been and um, and and demanding and kind of also airing different ideas than than those that are found in the kind of more mainstream ideas of Green New Deal. So um, why I'm optimistic is is because of kind of the uh, I think the decolonial engagement with the Green New Deal uh, that is engaging with this idea is not throwing the <laughs> throwing the uh, the water, basically, the bathwater. And also, um, I think COVID-19, although it has it has been very destructive on many communities, I think it has also given us uh, some leverage uh, to push with. Well, I'm glad you ended on that optimistic note, or at least partially optimistic uh, note, uh, as m- many of our episodes in this second season of the podcast have. But uh, we're, we have to leave it there, unfortunately, as we're out of time. But I do want to thank you guys both uh, very much. This has been a really enlightening discussion. I won't try and summarize it because it's been way too nuanced and I wouldn't do it justice. But I do thank our, our two guests again, Bengi Akbalut and Susan Paulson. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having us. It's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure to talk with you. Well, it's been great to have you. And a reminder, the podcast is made available under a Creative Commons License 2.0. Uh, please share it widely. We just ask that you provide appropriate attribution. And please follow us on Twitter at EcopoliticsP. That's Ecopolitics with a capital P. And get in touch. Our website is at ecopoliticspodcast.ca. The Global Ecopolitics Podcast is produced by Nicole Bedford. Support with transcription and captioning is provided by Kika Mueller. And Adam Gibbard helps us with artistic design and digital support. Thanks again, and we'll see you all in our next episode.